Oops, I'm going to grab the wrong sheet here. Those of you who didn't bring one, we have pew Bibles down underneath your chairs. I think the page number you're looking for in the outline, if you want to look that up, is page 1199. That'll help you a little bit there. We're back in James. We've been gone for the last couple weeks with guest speakers. We're back in James today. James, wisdom for living the Christian life. James chapter 1. Now, I confess, I feel like we're flying through James as I was preparing the sermon and then going over it several times this week. I thought, man, I need to stop here and, well, the word that came to my mind was harp on this for a while, but teach is really the right word, right? Um, but we're going to kind of fly through this a little bit today. But James is a challenging book. It's one of those books that just, it throws out challenges to us as Christians, as believers, and it really, man, it's just got so much good stuff inside. Before we get started today, let's open up with a word of prayer. God, we come to you today. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that we can pick this book up, that this book has wisdom for our lives. And God, I thank you. I thank you for knowing what we need before we know what we need and for providing that for us, Lord. Bless our time today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, James and the Christian's cheat sheets. In your bulletins, there is this outline. If you want to fill in the blanks, kind of help follow along, keep you awake a little bit longer, that'd be good. James and the Christian's cheat sheet. The Christian life, like chess, is complicated and requires strategy. Now, have you ever thought of your life like chess before? Have you ever thought of that? How many of you here enjoy playing chess? I know I asked this a while ago. Brian, I know you were in. Some of you guys are good chess players. All right, this is awesome. We're going to have a tournament one weekend. No, we're not, but that would be bad. Okay, but anyway, it's the Christian life is kind of like chess. It's complicated. Can I get an amen on that one? All right? Do you understand this? And sometimes you've got to have a right strategy. You've got to know what you're going to do, and sometimes you've got to plan ahead. We understand that. There are a lot of different areas of life. Financial, right? Financially, if you don't plan ahead financially, what's going to happen? Well, we understand the, we understand the recourse or the, the, well, the penalty, I guess, for not planning ahead in life. The Christian life is just like that, all right? In the first chapter of James, we're introduced to a cheat sheet that will give us the beginning strategies we need to succeed as a believer. James basically gives us specific, I'm going to call them chess pieces, that we need to have on our board of life to help us succeed in life, to help us get victory in life. And then he gives us some basic moves, and then it's from us, it's up on us there to take those moves and embellish upon them a little bit. But he gives us some basic moves to help us gain victory in our Christian life. Let's look at this here. We're going to begin in James chapter 1, verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let's stop right there. Know this, my beloved brothers. He begins this conversation on the cheat sheet with this. It's a reminder of who we are. Now, if you've ever seen people play chess, checkers, whatever game, sometimes football on TV, you think, you know what? I think that player forgets whose team he's on. You ever seen that? Is he playing for his team or the opposing team? Come on, you guys have seen that, right? Give me some response here. Help me out, people. Okay, we've seen this, haven't we? You sit there and look, dude, what are you doing? Did you sell out? Are you not paying any attention? James is reminding us, say, look, here's your team color. We are brothers, my beloved brothers. What team are you on? Okay? He's, it's a reminder. He said, look, in this game of life, in this chess game of life that we're doing, you are on this specific side. We're on the same side. You are my beloved brothers. Now, what exactly does that mean? We are beloved. I want to look at this just briefly, this whole idea of being beloved. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Let's look at what the word comes from. Agapitas. All right? Now, agape. You guys understand that word, right? You heard of agape love? We've heard of that? Okay. God's kind of love for us. Agape love. Well, this, this word beloved comes from that. Agapitas. Which means this. It's a beloved. Literally mean beloved. Pertaining to one who is in a very special relationship with another. Well, what is that special relationship? Well, we mentioned this two weeks ago. Verse 18. Back up one verse. Verse 18, James chapter 1. Of his own will, this is God he's talking about. So it's of God's own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. That phrase, he brought us forth. 
Two weeks ago, we learned that literally that means he gave birth to. It doesn't mean brought us forth. It doesn't say brought us forth. It means he gave birth to. So God gave birth to us. And when you are of the same birth as somebody else, what are you? Brothers, sisters, your siblings, right? We're in a very special relationship with one another because God has literally given birth to us through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus says in John chapter 3 that unless he is born from above, okay, we translate it born again, but it's born from above, which interestingly enough, James 1 verse 17 says all good things come from above, Okay, are you tracking with me? Do you see where this is going here? We're brothers because God gave birth to us through Jesus Christ. We are in a very special relationship. And, and James mentions that. He said, look, my beloved brothers. We're beloved. We are brothers. We're siblings. This is what we are. We're together in the same family. And then he goes on to challenge us this. He says, look. He says, here are some chess pieces that you need in your life. Let's continue on to verse 19. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Man, those sound pretty easy, don't they? Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Okay, pastor, I got it. Well, you're better than me because you guys know that I'm, well, while I'm slow to speak, I'm very slow in my speech. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> Fine. Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. How many of us have this down pat? 100%. I'm glad nobody raised our hands. All right? I didn't give you much time to do that, but that's okay. We're, none of us are here, right? And James says, look, you need to be this. You need to be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Why? Because the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So he says, first, here's the chess pieces you need. You need these. These are some good basic chess pieces. These are kind of like your pawns. They're your defense to keep you from getting in some crazy situations. Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. That's what we need in our life. We need to be that. He says, put away wickedness. Verse 21, therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. And we think, well, my life's not that bad. I'm not that bad of a person compared to so-and-so. And that's probably true compared to so-and-so. We're all pretty good, aren't we? Whoever so-and-so might be. But it really doesn't matter what I think about my life. What does God think about my life? And we're going to see in this passage here where James recognizes that we all have that mentality of comparing ourselves to others sometimes and not really examining ourselves very well. He says, look, quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, putting away all wickedness. You've got to get rid of it. You've got to get rid of the wickedness. And what, where do you go for the standards of that? Well, the first place that I would begin is the Ten Commandments, right? Exodus chapter 20. That's a pretty basic place. Where are we at in life? Where are you at in following the Ten Commandments? How do you do in just those? Right? And, he, I mean, we understand in that, you know, the, the whole thing that I heard growing up is, you know, don't drink, smoke, chew, go with those who do. Right? That's what I had. That's my advice as a kid. And so, there's something you stick out in your mind. Don't drink, smoke, or chew, go with those who do. Okay? Now, inherently is, you know, we sit there and think about that. Well, that's a legalistic perspective. And, yeah, yeah you're right. It is. But First Corinthians says that bad company corrupts good morals. So we understand how there's some, there's some wisdom to that whole principle. But if we examine our lives carefully, we could understand that all of us probably have some areas of wickedness to get rid of. All of us do. And the power of the Holy Spirit is there to convict us of those areas. So my question to you is, you sit and you think about your life, is there an area that you need to deal with? That as of yet, you've been unwilling to. And maybe it's these first three, that quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. God, I'm not good in one of those, or two of those, or three of those I need to learn something. I need to get some chess pieces on my board to kind of help me out here a little bit. Put away wickedness. And what do you finally do? You receive the word with meekness. What is the word? Well, we understand what the word is, right? Receive the word with meekness. God's wisdom for our lives. And I love that part, with meekness, because what happens is we get the pride. We say, I'm good in these other areas, and God, I don't have any wickedness to deal with. And so all of a sudden, you've already blocked out the ability to receive the word with meekness. We have to be willing to do that. And we are unwilling sometimes because of these, this pride in our lives. God, I, I, I'm good. I'm good, God. Are we willing to receive the word with meekness? 
And this is an interesting thing to think about. Receive the word with meekness. If you do that, the result of using this cheat sheet that he introduces, which is the word of God, okay, just in case you haven't followed, receive the word with meekness. The word being the cheat sheet that, that James is talking about here, okay, the word of God. And he says, if you do this, your soul will be saved. Now, that's an interesting passage. And we think about that, okay, receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls, now, is that an eternal salvation, or is that a temporal salvation? Well, we're going to look at that for just a moment here. Because there are many of us that look at that and say, okay, this is eternal salvation. If I receive the word of meekness, then I'm going to be eternally saved. And I don't think that's what the passage is teaching. And I'm going to explain why I don't believe this is eternal salvation, okay? Is James written to believers? Yes, my brothers, my brothers, my brothers, right? So if this is eternal salvation, then this happens. If yes, then either we can lose and regain our eternal salvation. Because think about that. What's the implication? If we don't receive the word with meekness, what do we not have? We do not have that which can save your soul. Are you tracking with me? I hope so. Okay, I want this to be clear, okay? I want you to understand that James says, look, receive the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. If you don't receive the implanted word, then you don't have that, okay? Hope that makes sense. Let's think about this from another perspective. How is it that we are saved? Well, it's faith in Jesus Christ, right? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Is the word how we get saved, or is Jesus how we get saved? It's Jesus how we get saved, right? Now, the word teaches us about Jesus, okay? But let's think about this. Understanding that whole idea that either we, can, either we can gain or lose and regain, or this concept is not talking about eternal salvation. Because if you don't receive, he's saying to his brothers, said, look, receive it and is able to save your souls, or don't receive it, okay, and lose that which is able to, re to re save your souls. But what kind of salvation is it talking about here? James is the very first book written in the New Testament. How was this phrase used in the Old Testament to save a soul? Joseph Dillow wrote a book. It's a huge, thick book, okay? But it's very interesting where he, in this book, he says this, in every instance in the Old Testament, to save a soul refers to being saved from some temporal danger, usually physical death, and not an eternal one. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Is there advice in God's word that can literally keep us from physical harm? Yes. Absolutely, right? Absolutely. I mean, think through history, for example. I was looking at a history book this week. The library is giving away some history books, and they had one in there on, on Gettysburg, the Battle of Gettysburg. And so they had a bunch of old pictures and, and portraits that people had drawn and pictures that people had taken. And one of those, it was talking about a general... Okay, a general who found a man with his wife and shot him in cold blood. Okay, now I'm drawing an illustration from that because here is a man who was killed because of an activity that he was doing that the Bible strictly forbids, correct? If he had followed God's word, would that have, quote unquote, saved his soul? Well, the answer is yes. Ecclesiastes talks about this. Ecclesiastes 7.17 says, Be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? Now that's an interesting thought, isn't it? Does God know when we're going to die? Yes, he does. All right? God knows everything. He knows when we're going to die. He knows the moment we're going to die. But we can do things to expedite that. And we talked about this a few weeks ago. And this whole idea of how the scripture gives us wisdom so that we can live in such a way as to, quote unquote, prolong our lives, that principle is an accurate principle. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, where it says, children do what? Children obey, obey the Lord. And why should we do that? Because this is the first command with promise. And what's the promise? That your days may be long upon the earth. Are you picking up on this biblical principle that if we follow the biblical principles, our lives may be prolonged? Not guaranteed, but maybe. Are you tracking with me here? This whole idea of the Christian cheat sheet, God's word, this whole idea that God's word can literally save your soul physically is a biblical idea, and James talks about that. You want to prolong the chess game of your life? Then you are going to use the cheat sheet that he gives you. 
you're going to use it because we can be overly wicked. We can be foolish. We've all heard those things. Famous last words. Hey, honey, watch this. Right? <laughs> we sit there and think, that is not a good way to start this conversation out. This is not going to end well. They're being foolish, aren't they? We can do that. I mean, we, we think about things like that, and, and goodness, I mean, you have friends of, hey, hold my beer and watch this. So that nobody, this is not going to end well. I could beat that train. It's not going that fast. You ever heard that one? Okay, example of my life. I was a teenager once, believe it or not. We had a youth group activity where we met down uh, on the Missouri-Iowa border, okay, on a gravel road. We had some friends who lived there. And we're all carpooling down there, different cars. I get there, and one of the first cars there. Here comes a third car in, and these guys come out, and they're all laughing. I'm like, what in the world? Man, I forgot that one hill was there, and these are Missouri roads, right? He said, I forgot that one hill, and I think I caught 20 feet of air with my vehicle. I forgot about it, and it didn't get slowed down. One of my friends turns another and says, well, I think I could beat that, and out the door they go. Now, what's the first thing in your mind? Well, that sounds brilliant. I'm going to go with them. No, I'm going to stay home and watch this train wreck, okay? That's foolish, isn't it? Every four years, we'd have a car, and we could almost trace that back. Every four years, we'd have a carload of teenagers that would do that same thing and flip in over in and kill everybody in it. In the high school class, they'd remember it. You know, their freshman on up would remember it. But then four years after the next generation come up, they'd do it again. It's foolishness. God's word gives us principles to keep from being foolish, to prolong our lives, to save our souls. All right, moving on. Don't want to beat the dead horse. And the result of this also is that you will be blessed. And he talks about this in the next paragraph, okay? Let's go ahead and read that. But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the cheat sheet, he looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So what does James say? Here's how to use it. You got to read it, you got to follow it, and then you enjoy it. Enjoy the results. Read the instructions. Follow the instructions and enjoy the results. James says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. Okay, how many of us here, I mean, we have to confess sometimes that, yeah, I hear it on Sunday morning, but I don't necessarily do it. Well, you can't do that. You can't just pick it up. You can't just read through it or you just can't hear it and not do it. It's not going to change a thing. My kids love Legos. And every now and then we get those little kits that build specific items, right? And they had one that had, it was a jointed dragon. It was really cool. The tail, I mean, it was fantastic, right? But there's very specific instructions to get from a jumble of Lego pieces to the end results. They were very specific. And my little girl, Eden, she is such, boy, that girl's going to be a builder because she follows the whole thing. The boys bring stuff to her to build, okay? And she puts the whole thing together, and at the end, she gets exactly what the picture says. But you got to follow it. We as men, what's our mantra? What's our, mon yeah, our motto, I guess, mantra, motto, when it comes to building things? I don't need no instructions, right? <laughs> Come on, we're guys. Who needs directions? <laughs> Goodness gracious, God gave me an innate sense. Honey, you're going east. No, I'm not. The sun is setting in the east tonight, but I am not going east. <laughs> right? We're there, aren't we? God gave us instructions. You can't just look at them and then put them aside. You actually have to follow them to get the end result, don't you? And I'll be honest, there are times that I've tried, oh, this is pretty simple, we can do this. <laughs> okay? Not so much. Okay? Now, we know that there are some that you just want to throw away. Ikea. Anybody here ever built anything from Ikea? Ugh. All right, those guys need stone. I'm telling you, they can't build anything with your instructions. It's horrible. That being that aside, okay, we understand that instructions do you no good if you don't actually follow the instructions. He says, be a doer of the word and not a hearer only, deceiving yourself. Now, this is an interesting thing right here. Here's a Hebrew word, shema. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word shema meant to hear. Did you know that in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew language, there's no word for obey? There is not a word for obey in the Hebrew language. What do they do? They repeat this word, Shema. Shema, Shema, Shema. They repeat it. 
which means sit up, pay attention, listen, give respect to, and then do it. We don't want you just to hear it. We want you to do it. That's where this whole idea comes from. And James is saying, look, don't just hear it. We want you to do it. That's how God's Word changes lives. Not by hearing, but by doing. You have to be willing to do it as well. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. Why do we have mirrors in our homes? Sometimes we ask those questions in the morning, don't we? Why do I have this thing? I don't get it so I can look at my spouse, do I? I don't get it so I can look at my kids. Why do you have a mirror? You have a mirror to look at who? Yourself. That's why you have a mirror. We have a mirror to look at ourselves. Okay? And James says, look. If anyone is a hearer, not a doer, it's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, a mirror designed to look at yourself for issues, right, for problems. For he who looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer forgets, but a doer acts, he will be blessed in his doing. I have young children. I don't know if you guys knew that, but I do. I have young children. They enjoy eating messy foods. Mustard, ketchup, sloppy joes, Kool-Aid, whatever it is, right? So every now and then they get from the table, it's like, dude, go wash your face. They go in the bathroom, you hear the water come on, you hear splashing, they dry their face, they come back out, and what do they have? They have food all over their face. <laughs> Did you not use the mirror in there? Oh, right, the mirror. They go back in, you hear the water, maybe a little bit longer this time, they come out, and maybe this time they've got it all. Because what? They use the mirror, right? Now, can we be honest with ourselves for just a second? I hope so. Are there some of us here, if we sit and think about it, could maybe use the mirror a little bit better? But we're just like those five-year-olds. Dude, you need to clean up your act. Why? I don't see anything wrong. I'm good. Did you use the mirror? And understand, the mirror is not so that I can point out problems in other people's lives. The mirror points out problems in whose life? Mine. That's the purpose of a mirror. And James, James is using the Bible as the mirror, very specific. It's for you, not for the person next to you. It's for you. Are you willing to look in the mirror and be honest with yourself and then deal with those areas of wickedness that you need to set aside, that you need to clean up? Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to be not just a hearer, but a doer as well? If you don't do this, what's going to happen? You're going to be stuck in denial. If anyone thinks he's religious, this is verse 26, if anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart. Okay, you think, wait a minute, pastor. You know, if anyone thinks he's religious, does not bridle his tongue. James is saying, look, we're going we're to repeat this again. What did I say earlier? Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. So here's a good sign of how things are going well in your life. If you can't even do the basic three chess pieces that I introduced to you, quick to hear, slow to speak, if you can't do those, then you, my friend, are in denial right now about how good your Christian life is, about how strong your Christian life is. Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Bridle your tongue. If you cannot even do that, you are deceiving your heart. You are in denial. And what else? Your religion will be worthless. Now, I hate the word religion. I'll be honest with you, because religion, to me, it's often kind of a man-made thing, feels like, doesn't it? What is this Greek word religion? What, is it, what does it mean? Well, it's thrace coast. And it means pertaining to being devoted to a proper expression of religious beliefs. Devout, pious, religious. You're being devoted to a proper expression of religious beliefs. Well, you know, as I understand God's word... And as I look at our church, you know, we're not here as a church to be proper. <laughs> Frankly, we're not very proper at all, are we? We're not very pious. We're here for what? We're here for relationship, aren't we? It's all about relationship. But religious people, it's all about what looks good. Are you, are you tracking with me? Do you see that? And James says, look, if you can't even bridle your tongue, your religion is worthless. You're a hypocrite. Your religion is is worthless. You're in denial and what you're doing is pointless. If you can't even bridle your tongue, it's absolutely pointless. So, what does he say for the instructions? 
He gives us these warnings. He gives us the chess pieces. He says the word of God is able to save your soul. That's your cheat sheet. So what does the cheat sheet tell us to do? Well, it's two things. And these are two basic chess moves that if you can get these down, you can build on. You can go from there, right? Once you realize how the pawns move, then you can realize what you can do. You can use them for defense. You can use them for offense. You can do lots of things if you have these two basic principles down. What are they? Well, visit the orphans and widows. That's one we don't really talk about much, is it? Visit the orphans and widows. And James, this is interesting how this is the first thing he points out. What's he say? Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this. To visit orphans and widows. I'm going to generalize this just a little bit. What's your attitude toward the least of these in our, in our community today? Last weekend, we had a strategic planning seminar with Jim Capaldo. We came in here, leadership, we came in here, we talked, and we're just looking at different things, the church, getting a different picture of the church. And You know what? We made an observation. We don't have one single parent attending our church. What does that say for us at St. Paul? Do you even know how many single parents are in our community? There are a lot. And yet we don't have one of those single parents attending our church. That's an interesting perspective for us as a church, isn't it? That should be a little bit convicting on us. Is there a piece of our community that we, to a degree, are overlooking? James says, visit the orphans and widows. Visit those who don't have dads. Visit those who don't have moms. Visit those who don't have a spouse. Even look around our church. We have a lot of widows and widowers. When was the last time that you invited one of those into your home? They get lonely, right? If I were to ask how many of them would love to be in somebody's home once a week, you know how many of them raise your hand probably? I would say 99.9.9%, right? A lot of them because they're lonely. When was the last time you thought about one of those? When was the last time you thought about somebody who's not living life like you are, somebody who might just need a relationship? Visit the orphan and widows. Remain unstained by the world. Keep oneself unstained from the world. How do you see stains? Well, I'm telling you, how do you know if you've got egg on your face? You can feel if you want to, but it's better to use a mirror. It's better to use a mirror. And are we willing to do that? You know, we're going to have communion here in just a minute. Communion is a time when we come before God and we, we're supposed to examine our lives. Examine our lives and make sure that we are in a right relationship with God before we take of the bread and take of the juice as a reminder of what Christ did for us. That's what it is. It's just a reminder. Are we willing to look at our lives before we do this in such a way and say, God, you know what? I've got, some, I've got some stains I need taken off. There's some things that's kind of between you and me right now. Yes, they've been forgiven, because Christ forgave everything. So my position with God, I mean, I'm good. I'm justified from God. But right now, there may be something between him and I in fellowship. That fellowship may be broken. And my question to you is, right now, is there some stains in your life? Is there some fellowship that may be broken that you need to deal with? Tim Capaldo, last week he ended the sermon, he said this, what's God telling you to do right now? And what are you going to do about it? I'm going to ask in your own life, as a believer, listening to this wisdom, wisdom for living the Christian life, is there some things that you need to deal with? Some things that you need to get right with God before taking the communion. The lady's going to come up here, Bud's going to come up here, they're going to come up here, they're going to sing a song, they're going to lead us in a song. This wonderful little song that's going to introduce this communion. And during that song, I'm going to ask you to examine, to look in the mirror. Say, God, you know what? i got some things i got to deal with. God, help me to do that. God, Lord, you gave us your word, and it's convicting, and you intended it to be that way. And Lord, I thank you for this mirror that we have, and I thank you that we can look in this mirror and we can examine our lives and we can see how we need to change, how we need to grow, how we need to mature. And Lord, I pray that you would help us in this. Guide us today as we even prepare our hearts for communion. Lord, give us the wisdom to not just look in the mirror, but actually see what may need fixed and then turn to you to do that. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.